the chat function in the WebEx control panel to communicate with me throughout the presentation. At the end of the presentation, we will take as many questions as time allows. You may submit your questions using the Q&A tab in the WebEx control panel. It's my pleasure today to welcome our presenters, Anthony Mann and Jennifer Radons. Anthony will share his perspective on tips for effectively connecting with customers on social channels and the five W's of social engagement. We are very happy to have him as our guest speaker today. Jennifer is a solution engineer here at Visible. Her specialty is showing companies how to structure social engagement strategies and workflow. Today, she will do a quick demo showing how to engage with customers on social channels. So now, I'd like to turn the presentation over to Anthony. Great. Thanks, Laura. Can you hear me okay? Yep. Great. Okay. So let me, uh, let me bring up my presentation. Sorry, everybody, one second as I uh, bring up my presentation. There it is. Great, so you can see it? Yep, thanks, Tony. Great, okay. Well, thanks everybody for joining today. Uh, this is going to be a great session, so let's just uh, get started. So let's go over the agenda, the things that I'll cover in the next, uh, I don't know, 25 minutes, half hour or so. Uh, first is uh, um, I'll briefly talk about myself and our company, uh, Corporate Online Services, and then uh, talk about uh, what is social engagement, because that means different things to different people, so we're going to chat about that a little bit. Uh, where do I start? So this would be uh, particularly good for those of you who might be new at engagement or need a, sort of a refresher. That would be great for you. Uh, what is sentiment? So we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about sentiment because it really is uh, critical and important for successful engagements. So uh, that will be a, a, a great session uh, or part of the session for us. And then as the title of the slides indicated, uh, we're going to talk about the five W's of social engagement. Uh, and these are the familiar who, what, when, where, why. Uh, questions uh, as it relates to social engagement, and to throw an H in there as well. Uh, the who, what, when, where, why is not necessarily in that order, but uh, we will cover them. And then uh, some tips and tricks for some uh, successful engagement, uh, followed by a Q&A. So uh, I do want this to be a thought-provoking session for you. Um, it, it won't answer every question that you have about social engagement because it is such a complex topic. In fact, we could probably spend an entire session on each one of my slides that I'm going to show you. Uh, but it will be a really good overview for you. And for some of you, some of the things that I cover will actually get you to think in some new and uh, different ways. So to start, let's uh, talk a little bit about me and our company. So again, my name is uh, Tony Mann, Anthony, I go by both. Uh, I'm the president of Corporate Online Services, and we are a Microsoft preferred vendor for social media. And so what we do is social media strategy, engagement services, forum management, content generation, to name a few. And uh, I've authored uh, 15 books, which uh, has kept me quite busy. And if you'd like to know about our products and services or this presentation or anything, please do contact me. There's my contact info, uh, tman at corporateonlineservices.com, and I'll put this up again at the end. Okay, so let's just dive into what is social engagement. Well, social engagement really means different things to different people. In fact, if you ask 10 people, you're probably going to get 10 different answers, even if those 10 people are within the same company or within the same team. But really, at the core, social engagement is about two things. It's interacting with online communities, but it really is about customer service as well. So your interactions are geared towards helping people and promoting your product and service. So isn't that customer service, really? So a lot of people don't really think of social engagement as customer service, but at the core, it really is. The specific details of those interactions with the communities is the key to achieving your goals. So the way you interact, where you interact, all those W's and the H that we're going to discuss, those are really key to achieving your goals with uh, social engagement. 
And right off the bat, I really want to point out that the wrong engagement can hurt the reputation of you, of the company's brand, or the company itself. And I really can't stress this enough. Really, if you just look at what happened last week with the interns at the NTSB, uh, you'll get the full picture. So I won't go into that in too much detail, but if you don't know what I'm talking about, just go to your favorite search engine and type in intern NTSB, and it'll be the very first item on the list. Okay, so where do I start? And these are actually in no particular order. Uh, first thing is you start with an aggregation tool like Visible Intelligence. So aggregation tools will let you find the conversations that you care about. So we've been working closely with Visible for more than four years, and we've gained a real deep understanding as to how to find those conversations and refine the searches for our clients' engagements. So uh, we've also worked closely enough with them to be able to help shape the product, uh, really give some feedback into the features and functionality and, uh, that, are, that are in the product today. So also throughout this presentation, uh, I will refer to visible intelligence quite often, and I refer to it interchangeably as visible, visible intelligence as along with VI, so I could use either term along the way. Okay, so uh, you may or may not know that VI can help you focus on specific keywords or groups of keywords. And this is really important because it helps you to finely tune your searches. Uh, this lets you get at your targeted conversations. So it's important to filter out the noise that really doesn't matter to you, or in other words, it doesn't address your target audience or goals. So you want to filter that noise out, and you do that in VI by specifying uh, keywords, groups of keywords, and you could actually exclude keywords as well. And we'll talk more about target audiences later. And you want to create a strategy and engagement plan. So you'll hear me talk more about strategy and engagement plans later. Uh, but at this point, it's really important just to keep it in mind before we even begin uh, that, that you have to have a strategy not only for social media all up, but uh, a plan for how you're going to engage and support that strategy. Okay, so let's talk about what is sentiment. We're going to spend a little bit of time on this slide, even though I realize that you don't see much of the slide yet. Uh, I mentioned before that understanding sentiment is really important for successful engagements. So, so as we spend time, uh, I'd really like for this to be kind of an interactive session if possible, and I realize your phone lines are muted, but if you could please use the chat window or be ready to use the chat window as we go through this, I'd love to get your thoughts and, and comments uh, on this as we go through. So there are four types of sentiments, and I'll list them, I'll show some examples, and then we'll chat about it as we go through. So the first is negative, then there's positive, neutral, and mixed. These are the four sentiments, and so I'll go through them uh, briefly and, and talk about them. So negative is pretty obvious. It's uh, the overall tone of a post is negative. Um, this is a complaint or you know, anything along those lines. We've all seen lots of negative posts. Positive, similarly, is very obvious in that uh, the overall tone is positive, the person loves your product or service, so it's very positive. What might not be so obvious are the two bottom ones, neutral and mixed. So a neutral post has no actual sentiment expressed. It doesn't mean the poster doesn't have a sentiment. It doesn't mean that they don't like or hate your product or service. It just means in the post that you're responding to, it isn't expressed. And so as a responder, as an engager, you, you actually don't even know if the, the person likes or dislikes the product or service because there's just no indication. So that's a neutral sentimented post. Whereas a mixed post is a combination of sentiments. It's usually positive and negative at the same time in the same post, but it could be uh, negative and neutral, it could be negative uh, and positive, positive and neutral, or even all three. Uh, but it's most likely going to be positive and negative at the same time. So let's take a look at some examples. Now, the examples that I'm going to show you here are, are real. They're all from Twitter, although this works just as well for blog posts or any other form of, uh, of conversation that's taking place in any channel. Uh, but just for the sake of ease and, and um, uh, conciseness, I took some Twitter posts and I removed any of the personal information. But rest assured, they are real. I didn't alter them in any way except for remove some of the handles and, and names, et cetera. All right, the first one, uh, and I'm going to read this for those of you who are on the phone um, and can't see the web presentation. So an example of a negative post is this one. You have horrible agents on the phone, and your billing department is less than subpar. So there is no way that this is not negative. You can't, you can't spin this in any sort of way to be positive or anything else. This is a negative post. 
Uh, the next one, positive. So I highly recommend the Redstone Restaurant in Minnetonka, Minnesota, very upscale and great A1 food. This is a beautiful post. This is the kind of thing that we'd all love to see for all of our products and services. Uh, this doesn't always happen, which is, of course, uh, what we're going to be talking about, but yet this is a very positive post. Hi everyone, it looks like uh, we just lost Tony, but um, he is uh, dialing back in. Sorry about that. Hi, everybody. Sorry about that. Can you hear me now? Yes. Yep. Uh, Thank great. you, Tony. My, yeah, my, my call got dropped. I hope that doesn't happen again. Um, where where did I get dropped off? Did, did you hear me talk about negative and positive? It, it looks like uh, at the start of neutral. Okay, great. So the next post is neutral, and uh, I'll just read it briefly. This shower has no mat and no textured floor. If I fall, you better believe I'll be the owner of a hotel chain in Norway. So this particular post, uh, you might think, well, this is negative. It, it doesn't sound very good, and it's negative. But is it really? So uh, does it express a, a sentiment? Not really. This could just be an observation. This could be, you know, the shower has no mat. You know, somebody observed it. It's not like th this person fell, hurt themselves. It was a bad experience. There's nothing in this post to indicate anything like that. So this is a neutral post. Uh, next post is mixed. So this is a mixture of both positive and negative sentiment. Love the product, but had an issue. Customer service gave me a $10 coupon, but no instructions on how to redeem. Please help. This is a great post. I mean, they, they, loved, uh, they loved the product, but had a little problem. So why does sentiment matter? So, well, let me ask you this, and uh, hopefully the, uh, the, uh, you can use your chat window. Uh, which of these posts would you engage on? So maybe in, in the chat window you could let me know. Uh, Laura could read them to me uh, as you as you let me know, and let's sort of uh, open a discussion about this. Uh, so we have some people saying all of them. Uh, a few people saying definitely the positive. Uh, yep, lots of positives coming in. Okay. A few more people Great. saying mixed, and um, all of them except neutral. Okay. Great. Yeah, thanks, for, thanks uh, everybody, for letting me know that. So what I'm about to say is really kind of a general guideline. There's always going to be exceptions based on policies. But so here goes, and I told you I'd get you to think about things in possibly new and different ways. Uh, you actually don't want to engage on the negative or positive post, uh, and here's why. So let's, let's go through these in general, because uh, ultimately what your goal is, is, is to take the neutral post and move it to a mixed sentiment, and then take mixed sentimented posts and move them towards positive. And so we're going to go through these, each one, and talk about that I individually. So uh, negative post. Did, uh, Laura, did somebody say? Uh, actually, yeah, we had a few negatives. Can everybody still hear me? Yes. Yep, we can hear you. Uh, great. Okay. All right. So, so anyway, let's just go through them individually. So the negative posts, I said you, you wouldn't want to engage this, and this is why. So 
does an engager, somebody who's on the front lines uh, and actually uh, doing the responses every day, does that person have the ability to affect change? In other words, is that person going to be able to stop the horrible agents? Are they going to be able to change the fact that the billing department is less than subpar? Now, you could argue, well, the person could at least uh, respond to the post and say, what was the problem? I'd like to try to help. And that might be okay. You know, it really does depend on what your strategy is and what you want the engagers to do. But in general, think about this. Anytime that, I mean, we, we're all consumers. We all go through these uh, sort of, you know, we have problems with whatever uh, products and services that, that we use. How many times have you called somebody up on the phone and the, the first level uh, responder or the first level help desk will ask you, okay, what's the problem? And you describe it and they say, okay, we've got to escalate that. And you explain the exact same thing to another person along the way. It's a really bad experience and it just leads to uh, a lot of trouble. And is this really what you want to be spending your time doing? Now, I'm not saying that there aren't times that you would want to engage in it, uh, but your, your plan, your engagement plan and your strategy would have to specifically call for you engaging on negative posts. Uh, a lot of times that really can just open a can of worms and it's hard to get out of. Okay, in terms of the positive post, uh, you typically wouldn't want to engage on this either. Now, it's not that it wouldn't be nice to respond and say thank you or, you know, have, have some courteous exchange like that, but the reality is that you aren't going to make somebody feel even more positive. They already love the restaurant. They're not going to really, really love the restaurant by you uh, responding. And as an engagement team, is that really what's going to help you to move the needle? So. Uh, you know, it might be a nice thing to do to just respond and say thank you, but that's really not the, the core of, from an engagement perspective, you want to be engaging in. What, what you want to look at are these neutral and mixed posts. So let's go through those uh, in detail here. Let's talk about the neutral one first. So uh, this particular one, the problem is clearly that there's no mat and no textured floor. Now, obviously, uh, the, the person responding on this post is not going to have a textured floor installed. You know, they're, they're not going to arrange to have a textured floor installed in every bathroom and every room of the hotel. However, this could be simply a case where the mat is missing uh, for whatever reason. It could be the guest before this person stole the mat. It, it, could, it could be a lot of things. This could be very, very easily fixed. So you'd probably want to engage in this by first uh, ensuring the poster that safety is the first priority and that they will get this addressed. And this could be addressed in terms of content and maintenance and making sure that they get a new mat. It could be to alert housekeeping so that when they, uh, when they go through the rooms and they have a checklist of things to look for in the rooms, like is the mini bar filled and all those kinds of things, well, just make sure that the mat is there. It could be as simple as that. And so it would be pretty easy to take this neutral post and move it to a mixed or possibly even positive, depending on how it's worded and how it's handled. Uh, and then finally, the mixed sentimented post. Uh, this is what I call a bread and butter post. This is a perfect kind of post to engage on. So the person already loves your product, uh, but has an issue. This issue is easily solved by just telling them how to, how to redeem the coupon. Uh, they already love the product, so it'd be really hard to mess this engagement up. Um, but at the same time, it's one thing to make sure that, that the customer is happy. And remember, this is all about customer service. So uh, by, the, by the end of the post, by the end of the exchange, uh, the person is happy. You gave me instructions on how to redeem. Everything is good. But how do you kind of ensure that this doesn't happen again? Uh, so at, at a minimum, you, you would really want to um, alert customer service because they were initially the ones that gave them the coupon without instructions. And it could be that it was a new person uh, within customer service. It could be that uh, it was just an oversight. Maybe the person didn't actually know how to redeem it. So instead of giving bad information, they just omitted the information. But nevertheless, customer service might have a problem. And so you alert them and let them know that this not only took place, but that you took care of it. Customer's happy, done deal. So then you're, uh, you're ready to move on. So, and again, um, so your goal here, as we've gone through each of these posts, is really to take neutral posts and move them to a mixed sentiment. And when I say move, I mean it could be as a result of a single engagement or it might be uh, over time. You want to take the posts, move them from neutral to mixed, and then from mixed to positive. And that's, in a nutshell, what your overall goal is. So... Before I move on from, from this slide, does anybody have any questions, or Laura, is there anything in the chat window about, uh, a, about that, or does anybody have any sort of conflicting opinions about what I said? Nope. Sounds like uh, everyone agrees with you. 
Oh, um, there is a comment that just came in. What's wrong with positive? Well, nothing's wrong with positive per se. It's just really what are you going to say other than thank you or have some kind of courteous exchange. Uh, you, you can't make this any more positive. So if, you, if your goal is to just simply acknowledge a positive post, then great. Go, go ahead and do so. But if, you, if your goal is to move the needle and change sentiments uh, in the way people are talking about your products and services, there, this person is already talking positively about the product. So, you know, if, if your engagement plan calls for responding to every positive post with a thank you, then, then go ahead. But if there's enough of those, and, you know, just a lot of thank yous, you know, will, will that become noise? You'd have to ask yourself that. So it, it's, not, it's not that there's um, – it's not that you don't want to respond necessarily. You just have to really consider the consequences of, of responding both in positive and negative. And this is the kind of thing, as we went through all these sentiments, this is not the, um, the immediate knee-jerk reaction when you, you know, when you talk about sentiment. You, you, know, you, you heard a lot of people uh, thought either you engage in positive or negative, and some people thought mixed. And I, if I remember correctly, Laura, you didn't say anybody thought we should engage on the neutral one. And it turns out that is one of the easiest ones to engage on. Uh, easiest, but also most effective. So are there any uh, additional questions, Laura, on this slide before I move on? No, that's it. Just the comment that that was a great explanation. Oh, great. Okay. Okay. So let's start talking about the five W's. After all, that's what uh, pulled you into the into the uh, presentation, right? So the first one. Let's talk about the the first W. Uh, why would you engage? So the simple answer really is that if you don't, who will? Uh, your, your competitors, they're very happy to engage with your customers. Uh, they'll be happy to uh, try to pull them over to their side. So, uh, so you want to engage. Uh, I, I think that's, that's kind of why we're all here on the, on the call. Everybody knows they need to engage. But you can't just jump into engagement. You can't just say, okay, I'm on the job, let's go. Uh, you, you do have to uh, plan for it, and that's what we're going to sort of talk about in the next couple of slides. So your engagement should support a strategy. Your, your social media strategy really needs to have an engagement component to it. It's not just uh, you know, social uh, all up, but it does have to have an engagement component to it. And that's going to become more clear if you're not familiar with that. It's going to become more clear as we go through the rest of the Ws. So, um, yeah, so again, your engagements need to support the strategy. And dare I say, if um, – uh, if the engagement doesn't support the strategy, then your strategy is either wrong or it needs to be reevaluated. I mean, they go hand in hand. Your, your engagements have to support the strategy, and if they don't, so something's misaligned there. And don't just engage for the sake of engaging. So you want to engage with your target audience, and once again, you want to move them from neutral to mixed and from mixed to positive. So you don't want to just engage just because either you know you need to do it because everybody else is doing it or you're afraid that your competitors will come in and, and uh, take up some of those conversations. I mean, that, that'll happen, and it's a, it's a good reason uh, to engage, but you don't just jump into it just for the sake of engaging. You, you do have to plan. So the second W, let's talk about who will engage. So a couple of options here. You can have um, an internal social team. Uh, you can bring on an external social team, uh, like what we do for our clients. Uh, you can have uh, people that are responsible for the products and services. Um, you, they'll, they'll play a part in the social engagement. But the reality is uh, you'll generally have a mixture uh, of these on your team. So talking about teams, let's talk about uh, team structure a bit. It's really important to define that because everybody on your team needs to be qualified, very qualified. So not only to discuss your products and services, which is you know, really pretty obvious. You know, you're not going to have somebody uh, you know, talk about your product if they don't know anything about your product. Uh, there, there's certainly ways to help less experienced people talk about your product. You, know, you can have cheat sheets and data sheets and all this sort of stuff. But obviously, they have to have familiarity with your products and services. But they also have to be skilled in communication. So on the last slide, I talk about some tips and tricks, and we'll go through some specifics when I get there. Um, but, but just know that it's, it's really important um, that they be skilled in a lot of different ways. And um, when we talk about team structure, it's not just the frontline engagers, as I've called them, uh, but others as well. And we're going we're gonna to see that right here. 
where you want to consider how you uh, escalate issues. So it's really unlikely that the frontline uh, engagers, the ones that are touching the post every day, will be able to handle every issue. It's just very, very unlikely. Uh, they'll be able, to be able to handle a lot of issues, especially with training and things like that. But in social, things come up all the time, and you have to know how to handle them and plan for them, and that includes escalation. So as part of the engagement plan, you really need to know how issues will be escalated. And this varies from business to business. So if you're a product business, it's going to go one way. If you're into technology, in another way. There's, there's a lot of different uh, variables here, but uh, you do have to have a plan for escalation. And this could be something that somebody's responding to. So somebody posts something uh, in a forum, and you need to respond to it, and you don't know how. So that's, that's one thing. But another thing, too, is because there's some fine nuances in engagement, it could be that the engager knows how to respond or thinks he or she knows how to re respond and just wants to kind of double check. You know, they've checked it against all the policies and procedures and rules and all of that. But it's a little bit, uh, you know, the person's a little bit unsure. So who are they going to escalate that to? Is there a team lead? Is there you know, somebody else that you've defined that will look at the post and make sure that it conforms? Uh, before it actually uh, gets posted. So in terms of issue escalation, again, it's going to depend on your business. But in general, you, you know, you have a variety of people in roles, uh, people like engagement managers, team leads, marketers, uh, support people potentially depending on your product, and even uh, public relations, PR. If, um, you know, some, sometimes things can get out of hand and uh, requires PR for sort of an official response and to know how to handle it. And so uh, people have to be on point for uh, issue escalation. And we're going to talk about that uh, even further in a little bit. Okay, so the third W is where to engage. So it's really important to understand where your target audience uh, is listening and talking. So uh, simply, really simply, um, be because um, your audience is talking in a certain place, that's where you need to be engaging. So that's where your key influencers are, and your key influencers are really who can uh, negatively or positively affect uh, your product or service. So in a nutshell, you need to be where they are. Uh, determine which channels uh, are best for your audience and goals. So there are thousands of online sites, uh, some uh, obvious, some not so obvious. Um, you know, everybody on the call certainly knows about Twitter, Facebook, blogs, et cetera. Um, but there are, there are a lot of other lesser known uh, sites. There's, there's Quora, Sonos, Reddit. There's way too many others to mention. And sometimes the conversations uh, you know, are taking place there. So you need to find out uh, where those conversations are and, uh, and, and engage there. So uh, sometimes the conversations actually take place in really unexpected places. So just to give you an example, um, we were engaging for the Windows team at Microsoft and some engageable conversations actually took place over on the Corvette forum. So uh, I know that sounds very strange, and it was to us too, but uh, that's where the conversations took place, and they conformed to our target audience, and uh, that's, that's where the conversations took place. Now, I'm not saying that this is a widespread thing, but it definitely happened more than once. And so once again, you go to where the, where the target audience is talking because they're going to converse where they feel the most comfortable. Okay, so be aware of competitor sites. So one of the greatest things about uh, VI is that it'll find conversations wherever they are. So we talked about the channels and audiences uh, in the last uh, bullet point there. And it's really important to find, and VI can do that for you, but it can sort of have a negative effect too. It could find conversations in places that you don't want to engage. So, uh, and that's one of the potential downsides. So, um, VI doesn't have any concept of who a competitor is in the marketplace or anything like that. It's just going to find the conversations. So, for example, should Merck be engaging in conversations on a Pfizer forum? I mean, how well would that go over? You know, or, or Delta on a United forum or Microsoft on an Apple forum? Um, so you get the picture. But the, the main thing is once you find these conversations, if VI pulls them up, uh, you can easily exclude them as well. But uh, don't, don't just say, okay, we found the conversations in the competitor sites, let's exclude them. You always have to be on the lookout for conversations that don't take place uh, where you want them to or that you explicitly want to uh, not engage in those. 
Okay, so the fourth W, uh, when to engage. So this differs by channel. I just want to make sure, I'm, am I still on? Since I got disconnected before? Yep, you're on. Great, okay. I'd hate to have to repeat myself again. So, uh, so the fourth W, when to engage. So uh, this really does differ by channel, uh, social media channel. So the, the timing of your engagements are affected by this. So, uh, for example, Twitter and Facebook, they need quicker responses, um, possibly 24 by 7. Uh, forums and blogs, they can have longer response times, you know, maybe 24 to 48 hours. That might be acceptable. But, uh, you know, as, as a general rule, uh, Twitter and Facebook need uh, quicker responses. So you really need to think of this as part of your engagement plan and determine how responsive you want to be with your audience. So, and, you know, once again, remember that if you aren't talking, somebody else is. And so based on that, you have to think about, okay, you know, I didn't really want to do this 24-7, but it might be worth it. It might be better for my product or service. So you do have to kind of, kind of give that some thought. So then there's proactive and reactive engagements. Uh, so proactive, that's really just where you push a message out. It's um, like if you have a product launch or a new service or even an event like this one, um, you know, where a, a message will go out and say, you know, hey, check this out, go to the site, you know, you're Hi, sorry everyone, it looks like uh, Tony dropped again. Um, sorry about that. Um, let's just hang tight. I'm sure he'll be back in a moment. I think Tony's going to have to talk to his uh, cell phone carrier or uh, phone provider. Hi, everybody. I'm sorry about that. Yeah, I don't know why I keep getting dropped. I'm, I'm sorry about that. But just look at it as an opportunity to communicate amongst yourselves, right? Is anybody <laughs> buying that? No? Okay. Well, I'll have to, we'll have to find out who your uh, provider is and uh, send okay. out tweets. Uh, yes. Yes, except this one will be negative, so you don't want to respond. <laughs> okay, there you go. <laughs> so, yeah, and I'm sorry, and I, I hope it doesn't happen again. If it does, I will certainly just call back in. This is uh, not the best of circumstances for that, but let me just plow forward anyway. So uh, from a reactive standpoint, so either somebody's going to be reacting to a post that you um, make proactively, or it's going to be more of an ad hoc um, response, kind of like what we saw before uh, with the four sentimented posts, um, so where you, you react to those. So you'd also want to engage in a way that uh, doesn't look automated. So it's fine to have an automated proactive message, uh, such as like you're going to tweet or blog something. But for reactive responses, you, you always want to make sure that they don't seem automated in any sort of way. So th this can kind of happen if, let's say you had a list of canned responses that your engagers choose. If all they do is copy and paste those, those uh, canned messages into a, a response, it's going to look automated. Maybe not the first one, maybe not the second one, but over time it's going to look automated. So it's fine to have a set of canned responses but as a guideline, not as a copy-paste sort of mechanism. Um, so, so yeah, so that's really important not to copy and paste because, you know, you really want everybody to be part of the community. You want your engagers uh, to, to not lose credibility. Uh, so automated responses will make them lose credibility and it might actually even get them banned. All right, so the last W, uh, number five, is what to engage. So it is equally important to know what not to engage as what to engage. So sometimes not engaging just comes with experience. I mean, we did speak a little bit before about uh, sentiment and sometimes when you possibly don't want to engage like in the negative or positive sentimented posts. But some of it does come with experience. Uh, experienced engagers, um, they've seen lots of issues. There's been, uh, you know, flame wars and finger pointing and just all sorts of negativity uh, that you generally just want to stay away from. You don't want to get in the middle of it. If you engage in those kinds of posts, you're just going to add fuel to the fire. 
So, um, and, and uh, one thing that's really important to mention is that, re remember, because of the internet and the nature of kind of the anonymity of the internet, people will be happy to chime into a negative post. They don't care what kind of, uh, you know, problems they cause because they don't mind talking about you or your product or service uh, over the internet, but th they say things that, that they would never say to your face. So ju just remember, they would have no problem uh, really helping to sling, uh, you know, the, the problems um, in all directions. Okay, you also, you want to make sure, and we've spoken about this a couple of times already, you want to engage in posts that reach your target audience in your designated channels. So, you know, we, we've spoken about it before, but, you know, as an example, let, let's say you were engaging in a travel-related conversation, and you've determined that your goals are to reach uh, your, your elite or your platform, You know, do these people talk only in travel forums? Are they, if they're busy executives, you know, are they on Facebook? They might be, but they might not be. Uh, so you really have to find out where your uh, audience is talking based on those kinds of uh, uh, goals that you have. And you want to, um, we, we spoke about this before, you, you want to post only where it addresses your target sentiment. Uh, again, you want to move people from neutral to mixed. Uh, or from mixed to positive, unless your strategy specifically calls for addressing those negative posts. So, and, and even if it does, you have to be very careful about how you post there. Okay, so let's talk about how to engage. It's not one of the W's, it's, it's an H, but it is equally as important that you establish a rules of engagement uh, to document any decisions that are made, uh, any policies, procedures, or anything like that. And this really should be a living document. So invariably, over time, you're going to have some changes to your strategy or your engagement, uh, you know, anything like that. You're going to need to um, make sure that that's documented. Uh, earlier, we talked about team structure uh, and some roles. Uh, it, it's really important that this be part of that, that somebody is on point to make sure that the rules of engagement are always kept up to date. You could think of it like this. Let's say a new person was to join the team. And, you know, they've got good communication skills and, and they know about your product or service, all those things we talked about before. And they say, great, I'm ready. Well, how do they do this? How do they know what's acceptable, what's not acceptable? This is how they know. They go to the rules of engagement. Now, I'm not suggesting that they don't get training or anything like that, but this is, you know, the, the master guide to how you are going to engage. So it needs to be uh, updated all the time. You also need to make sure that all engagements conform to the rules of engagement. Having the document is one thing, but making sure that the engagements conform to that is a different story. It's kind of like if you make a law, okay, fine, that's great, but you have to enforce the law. So this is very similar. Now, it's pretty easy when, you know, you're on the job for a while, you know your job, you do it well, and uh, you're posting every day, eight hours a day, five days a week, whatever it is, and uh, you, you're, you're very used to your job and, um, it, it's pretty easy to forget certain parts of the rules of engagement. Somehow you really need to ensure that every engagement conforms to that. And there's ways to do that. It's going to vary by organization, but, you know, you could have checklists. You could do things like uh, require approval, especially for new people. There, there's ways to handle it, but it's the time where you don't conform to your rules of engagement that you're going to get into trouble. So just be very aware of that. And... You want to redirect as part of a conversation. It shouldn't be your conversation. So for those of you who don't know, a, a redirect is really just a link, and it points back to uh, a marketing or support site or something like that. And, and you don't want to just redirect. That shouldn't be your engagement, because you want the engagement team to be part of the conversation in the community and not seem like an automated bot. So uh, you wouldn't say something like, if somebody says, hey, I'm having trouble installing my printer, your response shouldn't be, well, check out our support page. That's not very helpful. And if you think about it again from a customer service perspective, you're not performing any customer service there. Maybe they'll ultimately get to, but you really weren't very helpful with that kind of response. Now, I'm not saying it's not okay to give them a link, but you want to be a part of that conversation. You, you want to show somebody that you understand uh, what they're talking about, you, you, you recognize the problem, and you want to make the post seem personalized. And then it's okay to give them a link as additional information. 
All right, so my last slide here is uh, tips for successful engagements. Some of this we kind of talked about before, but I'll just go through it again. So you want to document everything, all strategies, approaches, decisions, absolutely everything. Uh, and again, think of it in terms of, let's say somebody new comes on the team. How will they know what to do? And even if you're going to give them training, how will you know what to train them on? Or uh, what if you were on vacation when a decision was made? Or you make a decision while somebody else is on vacation? Or you know, wh whatever the case may be. The fact is, it always has to be documented. And in social media engagement, uh, th that that isn't always the first thing that people think of. It has to become part of your regular routine and kind of a mindset to make sure that, that these things get documented. And we've spoken about this before, about escalation paths. So, and again, this includes people from uh, you know, sales and marketing, uh, PR, product teams, what have you. Again, it depends on the, um, uh, on the actual business. But, but you want to establish these paths now uh, as you're beginning your uh, social media engagement uh, strategy. Um, it, it's really important because escalation doesn't happen uh, very often. You know, it might, might happen once a month, might happen once a quarter. But the, the reality is when it happens, it's going to happen quickly. And you don't have the time to start establishing who is on point in each one of these different roles. Uh, if you do have to escalate something. Imagine you contact PR for something that really blew up out of control, and they said, who are you? Wh what are you doing? You know, if, if they're not even aware of what you're doing in your role and what their role is in it, it's not going to go very well. So ensure that the team posts the same way. So you want your team to be professional and consistent. And the only way to do that is one of two things, and I've said this a few times already, is with documentation and training. You, you want to make sure that, that those, those things are consistent and, that, um, and how, how am I going to post the same as somebody else on my team if I don't even know what those rules are? So I need to be trained. I need to have a place where I can look up if I have a question, people to ask, places to escalate, all those things. This is what it helps to ensure that everybody posts the same way. But um, you, you also do this by ensuring things like grammar and syntax uh, are, are all very similar. And you define all these things in the rules of engagement, uh, the level of detail that you have in the post. You, you don't want to start talking in, at the bits and bytes level to somebody who's not an engineer. If it's a consumer, you're going to completely lose them. So you need to define all these things. And everybody on the team uh, who's going to be engaging needs to understand uh, that level of detail. Uh, also, the, the post length. You know, do, do you want to you know, write a five-paragraph response for everything? Uh, probably not. Nobody has the time to read that stuff. But this all has to be decided and documented. Uh, establish credibility or credentials for the engagement team. So more often than you think, uh, uh, people ask about the legitimacy of the engagement teams. So you know, in this age where there's a lot of identity theft and impersonation, things like that, uh, somebody can easily post looking like you. So it's a good idea to establish uh, in, in some way the, uh, the uh, credibility of the team. This could be an uh, sorry, a, a web page where you have everybody on the engagement team listed. It could be a lot of different, uh, uh, different ways to handle that. But the main point here is just to be prepared because you will get asked a question. Okay, most importantly, this is probably the most important thing I'm going to say all day is uh, to triple check your text before clicking the post button. You can't delete it ever. And so some, somebody on the call is probably thinking, oh, but there's a delete button. Well, okay, there might be, and you might delete that post, but how do you know that it didn't get picked up by an RSS feed or in syndication or, or anything else? You have to always assume that you can never, ever delete a post. So how do you overcome that? You make sure that it's right before you ever post. I know it sounds simple. It's kind of like proofreading a document before it goes out, but it's important, and you have to do it every single time. So consistency is the key here. Okay. Well, so I said that I would uh, – I mean, that, that's it for my presentation. Uh, I said that I would put my contact info back up, so, so there it is. And if anybody has any questions or, or uh, comments or anything, uh, well, we, we are having a Q&A session uh, right now. I'll turn it back over to Laura. But uh, other than that, please do reach out to me with any questions that you have. And uh, thanks very much for attending. And I'll be happy to take any of the questions uh, or comments. 
Great. Thank you so much, Anthony. Um, sure. So now, uh, Jenny is going to do a quick demo of how to engage with customers using visible intelligence and uh, bring to life uh, some of the uh, tips that Anthony has actually been talking about. Um, so with that, I'll let uh, Jenny take it away, and then we'll come back and do Q&A. Thanks, Laura, and thanks, Tony. There's a lot of, of great content that we talked about today, and I think in, what's really important is some of the first pieces of having an organized strategy and a thought process behind how are you organizing what you're engaging on and setting objectives and priorities with your engagement methods as well as, uh, as, well as how you structure your aggregation, your listening tool. So that's what I'll be talking about today highlighting visible intelligence. So if you haven't seen visible intelligence before, here's a snapshot of what our engagement tab looks like. It's really structured around taking a number of searches, putting them into one environment, and then giving users a place where in a single forum they can access all of their relevant, necessary content, as well as having ways to, to view it and report on those activities. Jenny, are you uh, presenting right now? Because I don't see anything. I am, but if you did not see anything, let me fix that. I apologize for that, and thank you for mentioning it. Yeah, there it comes. It's coming now. There we go. There we go. Okay. Yep. So this is what visible intelligence looks like. <laughs> and what's important is on that lower left-hand side is where we can highlight all of the searches with invisible intelligence that are relevant to engagement. What's great about this type of system is that you're able to label and organize the kind of content that you want to engage on using both those targeting keywords that Tony talked about as well as overall concepts and assignments based on naming conventions. So anytime you're saving a search, there's an option actually to show that in the engagement tab, and that's what you need to do in order to make this visible here. We can then name the search, assign in a folder to establish whose responsibility is this type of content. Also, um, what priority do we see that? So if we're putting that mixed and neutral content as our top priority, then we can use naming or numerical conventions in order to bump that to the top and create a clean workflow that speaks to our objectives and what it is that we're trying to accomplish with our engagement strategy. So breaking this out a little further, here's what these engagement searches might look like. So here we're prioritizing neutral content followed by that, that mixed content and leaving positive at, at the bottom. And then also supporting directly assigned content, perhaps particular promotions or, or, or keyword focuses, and then some of the own channels in this particular example. So pulling from this search, what might that look like? So here we have some neutral posts. We see what that uh, search is titled, and you'll also notice the filters in the upper right-hand corner, and this speaks to the targeting that Tony alluded to earlier. And that really is one of the most important parts of your engagement strategy, helping to target the content that you want to uh, work with, and then surfacing that in a quick, clean format so you can you know, work through as much content as possible. When you are engaging with a post, it is important to have the functionality that's necessary. So here we're looking at, at a tweet as an example, um, but we're able to support replying, retweeting, however it is that you're going to be supporting those engagement functions, as well as including permalinks and additional capabilities response actions that allow you to interact with different posts, but also allow you to communicate how you're supporting those actions with your team so that there's an a open communication structure with the other engagement teams. So here you can see we're also looking at a, uh, a tagging function, which allows us to classify, categorize data, and, and keep track of those behaviors assign posts to other users so we can communicate a set priority and routing that contact to the appropriate person. And then audit history to show each of those actions that's been taken within the post, who took that action, and, and being able to see what is the journey of that post and the speed to resolution, whatever that resolution 
definition may be for your engagement program. And finally, a notes option, which allows users to specifically write back and forth and explain uh, details and, and behind the scenes information that may be relevant to this particular post. And then finally, however you choose to go about this, it is important to understand what needles are you moving? What do those metrics look like? So with invisible intelligence, we have some content and some options that support that type of reporting. You may also have additional mechanisms to, to track latency, to respond, and, and to resolve, and uh, how many neutral posts or how, how are we changing that neutral to mixed or vice versa. Um, but it is important to, to target, to interact, and then report on all those activities and get a nice, clean social workflow for your engagement. And that's what I wanted to share from visible intelligence perspective. I know we have some great questions, so I'd like to open that back up to Q&A and turn things back over to Laura. All right, thank you so much, Jenny. Um, yes, yeah, so a couple of questions have come in. And uh, let's see. So uh, the first one is actually um, for you, Tony. It's um, you mentioned the rules of engagement document, and uh, someone wanted to get a sense of um, how extensive or detailed um, do these documents tend to be? Yep. Well, it's generally pretty uh, extensive. I, I mean, in, in terms of you want to make sure that all the elements that we talked about here today, that they're documented, all the four W's, and how you're going to engage, when you engage, when you don't engage. And the level of detail, while it's kind of a pain to write and to, to keep updated, the, the more detail you go into and the more examples you have, even if you put in the rules of engagement some examples like what I showed you on the sentiment slide, the more examples you have in there, the better the quality of the engagements are going to be. Because you're not going to use the rules of engagement just as a living document that just sits on a SharePoint share somewhere or, or whatever. Uh, you're actually going to use it in your trainings as well. So one of the things that, that we do is, like, uh, my team leads will go through uh, on a regular basis and go through some sample posts and talk about, you know, how could this have been better? What was, what, what was the uh, interaction? Um, how could that have been changed if it didn't go exactly as you had planned? And, you know, so basically what worked, what didn't work, you go through those things all the time if you have, you know, a, a good uh, plan for engagement and, and training the engagers. So this rules of engagement becomes part of that. So the more detailed it can be, the better. Great. Um, and we have another question referring back to sentiment. Um, someone asked, uh, doesn't it make sense to respond to positive posts in order to validate the poster's time spent talking about your company? Others might see the reply too and decide that it's worth posting uh, their own positive experience since the company is listening? Well, so again, it, it's, it, I, I didn't say, you know, explicitly don't ever respond to positive posts. But in general, I go back to what I said before. Do you really want to uh, spend your engagement team's time, at least the majority of the time, responding to those positive posts when they aren't moving the needle for your products and services? Uh, you know, it's fine to acknowledge that, but the, does somebody, uh, I mean, I, I really kind of turn the question around. Does somebody or does everybody really need acknowledgement that uh, they, they posted? I mean, it, are they posting it for you because, you're, uh, uh, because you have the product and service, or are they posting it for the community? And in which case, if it's for the community, is it really necessary for you to post, you know, thank you on every positive post? Uh, and, you know, I, I really submit that the, the answer is no. So you, your, your time is much better spent from a strategic standpoint uh, on, the, on the neutral post moving on to mix and mix to, to positive. And again, it, I'm not saying don't ever respond to a positive post, just like I'm not saying don't ever respond to a negative post. You just really have to know why you're doing it and know what you're, what you're getting into, especially for the negative ones. Uh, Tony, here's one about metrics. How do you set engagement goals, and how do you define success in terms of engagement? Yeah, so this is a big discussion. We could probably do a, a entire presentation on this. And I, I hate to say this, but the answer is going to be it depends. So 
because it does depend on what your goals are. If your goals are to recruit a certain number of influencers, then your metrics are based on that number. You have some kind of baseline or snapshot of where you are before you begin the program. You, you have a, a strategy for how you're going to get there and an engagement plan for, for the you know, frontline engaging. And at, at some regular interval, you, uh, you determine you know, whether you're meeting your goals based on those metrics. But a lot of engagements aren't based on metrics. So uh, again, it just sort of depends. I, uh, you know, when I, when I talk about ROI, sometimes I think of uh, something that I heard one time. Uh, I, I, I can't remember who originally said this, but uh, the, the, the phrase was, what's the value of your mother? You know she's valuable. You know you know she uh, you know she she provides value there. But how do you quantify that? Is, is it a metric? You know your your mother is worth you, you know 47. You, you know that's kind of hard to do. So in, in social it really is difficult, but it does depend on what your goals are. Uh, another, uh, if I could just extend on that, just uh, I know we're kind of running out of time, but uh, if if your goals are to do what we talked about before, where you're moving the sentiment uh, largely from from neutral to mixed and mixed to positive, that you can track over time using VI. So, you know, you're, you're monitoring the conversations, you're, you're seeing that the majority are, let's, let's say the majority are, um, you know, neutral at, when you start. And then you see over time that the majority are now uh, mixed and positive. So you have ways to know that you're moving the needle. Uh, and there's ways to quantify that in either percentage of conversations or percentage of uh, sentiment in the, in the conversations that you're, you're looking for and your target conversations. There, there's, there's all these different ways, but it does depend on uh, what your goals are to start with. I, I, I would not advise to just set arbitrary goals um, because, you know, how, how do you know if that's reasonable or not? And if it was never reasonable, if it was a, a, a bad goal to start with, then it's going to look like you failed when maybe you really didn't. Maybe just the uh, expectation was set incorrectly in the beginning. Great. Tony, here's uh, one about content. Is there a okay. pattern that you see among the viral videos that have taken social media by storm, like the Psy Gangnam Style or Harlem Shake, is there a formula to producing um, engaging and viral content? Well, so our, our engagements um, typically are not based on, on, on videos. So uh, it, it's more as it relates to a, um, you know, a, a product or service or, or that kind of thing. But you know, it, it's funny. Somebody also once told me, I'm going to create a viral video. And, it, you know, that, that alone is a funny statement because you don't create the video. I mean, you might hope it goes viral, but you, you don't actually create it for it to be viral. That's something that happens as part of the community. Uh, there's something about it that's catchy. There's, um, uh, you, you know, it's, it's, it, it's got something to it. It's a, you know, a great <laughs> jingle. It's a great, great phrase. It's, it's, uh, you know, it's got something to it, and people like it, and it goes viral based on that. So I, I would I would just keep those kinds of things in mind. Great. Uh, so we're coming to the end of our time here, so we'll take just one last question, uh, and this one's for Jenny. Uh, Jenny, does VI scour the web on its own, or does VI target locations that um, you have to specify? <laughs> Sure. So, visible intelligence will collect data globally uh, across the web, but it does so based on uh, working with data aggregators and, and existing data providers. The reason we do that is a lot of sites, namely forums and, and places where you're likely to find highly engageable content, have very specific terms and conditions about collecting and, and making that data available. So, while we collect Globally, we are scouring the web. There is a, a methodology uh, about how that's taken into account. It expands on a daily basis. Um, within your searches, within your targeting, you do have the options in order to target specific site locations through inclusion or exclusion. And that's really going to be based on who's your target audience, what are you trying to accomplish. So there's flexibility there in, in terms of the reach of data. It's hundreds of millions of sites on a global basis expanding daily. So hopefully that helps. Great. Well, uh, looks like we've run out of time. I'd like to thank you all for joining us. 
and we hope that you enjoyed the information presented today and it got the uh, wheels turning in your heads about how this can help um, your company. And a big thank you to our presenters, um, Tony Mann and uh, Jenny, for an informative webcast. And we'll be sending out a link to a recording of this webinar um, and the slides. So uh, thanks again for joining us today and uh, hope to see you at our next webinar.